You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And I'm Jared Mounts. We have a really good episode here. And guys, you know, this is this is really awesome. This is the last episode of our first season of uh, 2022. This is pretty crazy. And in, in less than 12 months, um, yeah, we've quadrupled in size. Uh, we are the fastest growing outdoor fishing show that specifically targets the DMV and the greater metropolitan area, states that surround it. Um, so here we are. This has been a really good run. And we wanted to cap it off with a really, really banger episode. Yeah, and you've done a good job, Thomas, of just content, like you say, what, 75, 76 uh, episodes uh, this, or this is going to be episode i think 80 81. 80 81 so i mean you just continue to pump out you know content and it's been no shortage of uh, interesting people and content and the fishing industry is wide open uh, a lot of different angles to go down but uh, it's just fun conversations <clears throat> and you know, i think it's so cool is like this long form con like mm-hmm. you know and we were talking before we started recording about how with the news and everything it's always snippets like you'd have right. these conversations broken down into like you got 30 seconds to say something mm-hmm. And you don't have a conversation anymore. Do a deep dive into things. Yeah, yeah, where we could just talk. Right. And what's so cool about this platform of doing a podcast like this, where we can just talk about an issue. And so, you know, one episode that we were able to 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 drop earlier this year was with you know the river keepers, like mm-hmm. with Shelby is mm-hmm. one of them. And we can just have it out for two mm-hmm. or three hours talking about an issue or whatever. Mm-hmm. We're talking about a bait, and that is so vital in this day mm-hmm. and age with social media, where everything's just short TikTok clips mm-hmm. of things, and you can get reactions versus like let's mm-hmm. actually try to get somewhere. And mm-hmm. move forward. And one of the things, you know, here at Jake's, we try to do too, is just making sure that, you know, we're selling things. Uh, ultimately, we want anglers to have success on the water, whether it's, that's the equipment they're using. Uh, a lot of, there's so many different baits out there. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just the, the market is flooded with different things. And so uh, also giving them, you know, why they should throw something or where they should throw it, how they should throw it, ultimately, again, so they have success. And so our guest today, uh, Scott Barrett, we met, uh, we were 10 years old, and it was probably, we were talking about Orange County show that we used to attend together, probably going back eight, nine years, maybe 10 years ago, uh, we first met him, and uh, he's with Nico Baits, they're at the a Japanese uh, manufactured bait, um, an interesting little side note too, I remember reading in the Woods and Waters about a young man that caught a huge, I want to say it was like seven or eight pounds, maybe 10, 10 pounds, double digit, 11 pound bass, Um uh, with one of his worms, one of the Nico worms. And this was um, Nolan Miner, before he was Nolan Miner. I mean, he's always been Nolan Miner, but as we know Nolan now after years of, you know, being on the, the tournament circuit, but that was a young Nolan Miner. He thinks when he was probably in 10th grade, maybe. So may I give you a little, you'll like this a little antidote is um, we're making more clips because we have, I th- we have like over 300 hours of content just on every mm. podcast. I went through the first podcast no one did, which was with us. Mm, yeah. And he said in that, when we asked him, what mm. tournaments are you looking forward to this year? And this was back in, in January last year. He said, like, I'm really looking forward to the Susquehanna. I think mm. I can win that. There you go. He, he said that on our it. show, and then he goes out there and wins it. <clears throat> yeah. So it's so cool to see his, like, he's such a great angler. It's yeah. so cool that you knew him before I knew him. Yeah. Um, and, wow, he's come a long yeah. way. So, and Scott, uh, great guy. Um great person and he told us i think two years ago two or three years ago at icast which i didn't know this uh that we were jakes was one of the first uh bait and tackle shops i guess in north america to carry the nico line or nico product so uh scott if you want to introduce yourself to the audience and the viewers and listeners and just tell us uh, who scott barrett is and how you got connected with nico okay sure um well actually i'm a from the dmv i Born in Manassas, grew up in uh, Fairfax County, and I've been fishing the Shenandoah since uh, 1972. Oh, wow. And um, <clears throat> I grew up with the love of the outdoors, like hunting, fishing, trapping. In fact, um, when I was growing up, we would trap, and I, I would sell the pelts, and that would be my fishing money for the, for the rest of the year. And that's the way I grew up. So I was trapping. involved in a lot of, always in the outdoors. Um, like I said, hunting, fishing, trapping, did a lot of conservation work. Um, when I was 16, I was the conservationist of the year for the state of Virginia. You know, I got to have 
dinner with the governor and secretary of interior came down. How did that work? How do you become like, how do you even like apply for that award? Well, like, I didn't how, buy at the time. I didn't like, know. I was just doing my thing. Okay. Um, but somebody nominated me. Hmm. That's so cool. And uh, cool. I just got a, I don't remember if I, oh, I think somebody told me, I think the, whoever wrote the letter called me up and told me, Hey, by the way, you, you just won this award. And um, I really wasn't familiar with what it was at the time. But it's it's very rewarding because when I go back to northern, you know, I'm in northern Virginia, I can actually see the the results of the work that I did at the time. Hmm. Um, you know, it's there. It's always rewarding when you can see that. Mm-hmm. And then you also, and then we talked about this off air a little bit, but you um, you went and you got a graduate degree, correct? And, and your background's not just in Bates, though. It, it's no. A fun story. So, um, again, I went to university here in Virginia. Um, I graduated in wood science. But what? Wood, wood science. science. Yes. Okay. I, what? What is that? What's, what's um, that? well, again, this part. Let me back up. I I had I was quest didn't know what I was going to do. Um, I wanted to be uh, an ornithology, ichthyology, or per, but I got turned off by a lot of the guys and those when I met. I didn't. Although I love the field. Um, I was turned off by a lot of the personalities in the field. Hmm. And so I, I met with the people involved in wood and they were just a different personality type. So um, utilizing wood is one of the best things you could possibly do for the environment. Um, anything you can make out of petroleum, you can make out of wood. So is this more of like when you say wood degrees, it's like forestry is usually? What no, no. Tree, you know, we always made fun of the forest, foresters because trees will grow whether you're there or not. Uh-huh. Um, it's what you do with the trees. <laughs> That's what's important. Gotcha. Um, so the the wood utilization. Okay. So how to utilize wood, and you know, for example, wood is the safest, most environmentally friendly thing hmm. available. You know, trees practically grow out of the air, and you it's just this marvelous resource. You know, and trees are utilized in ways that people don't imagine. Hmm. You know, like the lemon smell in your soap comes from trees. Really? Yes. And um, I mean, that's just one little thing. Um, mm-hmm. But you can build with it. You can make paper. Trees were uh, instrumental in the, the entire advancement of civilization through mm-hmm. history. Interesting. Um, so trees were, so that, for me, that opened up this wide range. I was always curious about a lot of things. So what you do with a tree is, you know, is almost endless. And, and so was this a, um, was this a master's degree, a doctorate, bachelor's or? Um well, I went to three universities. I went to uh, Virginia Tech, University of Washington, and then I finished, uh, I got a master's in biomaterials in uh, the University of Tokyo hmm. in how, Japan. How did that, uh, how? How did you, that's, uh, I get, Jared, I'm sorry. This is always the coolest thing to me when every single person comes on this show and they're like, I think this is boring. It's like, no, all these stories are cool that you are basically a mountain man with a beard, like trapping, winning awards here. Then you're getting into wood science and then you're in Tokyo. That's freaking cool. Crazy. There should be a book written about that. Okay. Well, you know, selling baits. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. Now I'm selling baits. <laughs> um, well, the thing is, if you just get out and live life, doors open. And um, I just step, kept stepping through and ended up in Tokyo. And he should be writing bumper stickers, too, because this that's wow. So you just did you apply for it? Was it a, was it a scholarship to go to Tokyo? Is that is that how that opened up? for No, you? I uh, when I was at the University of Washington, um, uh, one of my professors was the president of American Express in Japan. And he's the one who opened up the Japanese market to financial services. Hmm. And he's a very remarkable fellow. And he provided a really great framework for how Japan works. That is and so, so um, I was in a graduate program out there and I was kind of struggling at the time. And I said, you know what? I think I'll just go to Japan. And uh, you did it. I just want to learn. And I just decided to go. And I got into an English teaching program for the uh, first two years. And while I was there, I studied every living second. In three years, I mastered 30,000 vocabulary words, 8,000 Chinese characters, and that got me into their number. It's Tokyo University is like their Harvard or Yale for them, and got me in there from Japan, not as a transfer student. I earned my way from the Japan side. Wow. How good is your Japanese? I read, write, and speak Japanese and converse in it every week. That is so brilliant. That's pretty I've, awesome. I've translated for the Canadian embassy, um, Dude. Go- some governors in Japan. 
I uh, translate work that has gone to the um, the board of directors for Sony. Why are you hanging out with us? I feel like this. <laughs> <laughs> good lord well you, you have to follow like your passion you should be like a senator somewhere or something well, like good lord well <laughs> i've been around i've been around the world i've seen some things and uh sometimes when you work for the large corporate world and you see behind the curtain you realize that it's probably not the thing you want to spend the rest of your life doing mm -hmm. so and, uh, the, and then you went from that and then the last thing about that because i thought this was you you mentioned and if you want to talk about this you can if you don't that's fine the Three Gorges Dam, and then like that was a, a cool mega project that you mm. can find on YouTube. But you said you were like a part of that. A yeah, very, very peripheral yeah. part. Um, the three. So getting back to my wood background, um, the the I think it was Hitachi made the turbines mm. for the hydro project there. The turbines were so big that they had no way of transporting them. Mm. Oh my god. They didn't know how to trans. They, they built them and didn't know how to carry them. And I got a call to come and take a look because they trans. They need to transport with wood. And they prefer to transport with those various materials are possible. Um, but nobody had the engineering or expertise to design an efficient, reliable packaging crating system to transport the turbines. Wow. And so they contacted me. I showed them how to do it and it got it got the turbines to their dot to the site safely. What did you do? Like what was the key? Well, it was using engineered wood. So engineered wood involves pulling a tree apart, putting it back together in an engineered, predictable manner. And hmm. so I I I happened to work with a mill that was number one in the world with expertise and, and product. Of course, that that helps mm -hmm. um, to when you have a project like this, and so I was able to show them how to utilize our material and instruct them. Well, basically, just how to do it, and and gave them the expertise that they knew how to calculate things. And that's, I mean, they all have their own core competencies anyway, but they yeah. needed that little bit of expertise <clears throat> and show them how to do it. And that's what I did. So, yeah. So, the Three Gorges Dam turbines were carried on um, material that I I showed them how to design and supply. And and we're and, and guys, we're going to definitely, I know you guys want to do the baits too, and, and we're going to get there. <laughs> I really think context and backstory is so important mm -hmm. because you, you're thinking about this and your background with wood. It, was there a lot of engineering and design in the degree and what you did? Because And does that translate to what you ended up doing with, with Nico? Um, well... <sighs> Indirectly, I mean, it was biomaterials. So I have a, you know, a basic level of understanding of materials, material science, testing um, uh, procedures and protocols. Um, you know, I, I don't do much of it now, but certainly in the early days, you know, we would be talking about testing products for hardness. I mean, how do you test a product that's, you know, stretchy like this? There's, there's various ways to do these things and what we aim for. Um, you know, some of the results of this is Nico has some products that are engineered in a level of softness to perfectly mimic a newly molted insect, for example. So, you know, I, I don't remember the numbers, but, you know, I think, you know, I think Berkeley used to have a good research group. Mm -hmm. They would say, well, a fish can put a bait in its mouth, analyze it, spit it out before you even can react. Mm -hmm. um, so Nico utilizes this type of information and in, in science to design a bait that makes that fish hold on to it longer. You know, the fish doesn't realize right away that it's not the real gotcha. thing. So you're, what you're doing is you're, you know, the, the fish have a certain, there's almost like a checklist or a, um, it's like a cascading level mm -hmm. of criteria mm -hmm. where, where they bite and ingest a, a bait. And, you know, our goal is to trick them, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. try, try not to give it away that it's not real. <clears throat> so, so then how did you go from saving the Three Gorges Dam project after mastering a language in Tokyo to bait companies? Like that, that's, that's a fun jump. Well, it gets even more interesting. I was, I, I was at a, a trade show in, in Japan. Um, it was, uh, it was wood and wood engineering uh, items. And uh, I had some extra time. And right in the next big giant hall, um, if you've been to ICAST, it's a very similar mm -hmm. big giant facility. 
they had a biotech, um, a nanotechnology exposition. Of course they did. And so um, I decided to uh, go to the nano ex- nanotechnology exposition. And um, so I'm walking through there. And of course, it's um, nanotechnology at the time was mostly uh, medical and uh, manufacturing. And while I was walking through there, I saw a booth of guys with fishing soft baits. And that was Nico. That's so cool. Mm. All these things. Yeah. Good, isn't it? So, ah. yeah. So at the at the time, Nico, there's a um, there's this very expensive, very difficult to utilize nanotechnology process to make the plastic biodegradable, and uh, Nico was using that then, hmm. and that's why they were at the show. <clears throat> Unlike the U.S., um, in the U.S., uh, college professors or people will take grants from the government to do research then they patent it themselves and they pocket the money in japan if you take a grant from the government you're obligated to share those results for free Mm. and in in nico's case nico got a grant to they were the first company to take that nanotechnology implement it into a practical use for fishing soft baits and as because of that they were obligated to go to expositions and demonstrate what they had done Hmm. and open that to the public. Um, so the reason that Nico did that was, obviously the plastics that are typically used in fishing are not biodegradable. In fact, they're actually quite toxic. And so Japan's an island. And, uh, you know, you can't. there's nowhere to go. You pollute your island, you can't move on. And uh, so Japan's been very conscious about protecting their waterways and fisheries. And Japan has a, from from the time Japan was settled by, you know, what, two, three thousand years ago, you know, fishing and, and, and fish were very vital to their survival. And it has a really mm. deep part in their culture. And so Nico's part of that process where they want to protect their fisheries. And so they at that time they utilized that technology. You know, times have moved on and they're not using that exact technology anymore. But that's mm. how we got started. And then you just handed them a resume right then and then you started <clears throat> to work. And then how'd you get back here? Well, I... I just told them, I just love the stuff. You know, there's the old the commercial many, many years ago of, uh, I think it was the owner, the, the guy who bought the Gillette razor. And uh, he said he, he liked the product so much he bought the company. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've heard that in commercials. Um, for me, I, I just saw what they were doing. I just liked it so much. I said, I'm, I'm, I'll just find a way to be mm. useful to these guys because I want to be part of this. Because you know, our slogan is the future of soft baits. Or the next generation soft baits, and um, we really are. Did did you fish a lot in Japan? I didn't fish very much at all. Um, once I started hanging out with Nico, I, I I picked up fishing a lot, you know, more. And uh, there was a lot. You know, obviously, I love fishing, so I, I have I have gone fishing in Japan. Um, you know, you've heard people say if you go into a tackle shop in Japan, you'll just your mind will be blown. It is nothing like you could ever imagine. That's a bucket list for me. And uh, so bad. So, I I would go into fishing sh- shops even if I wasn't fishing, because it just just stimulates the mind. How I so? Mean, the their approach to nature, to hmm. design, to utility is on another level. Hmm. Detail oriented, very detail oriented. Yeah, so this, I, you know, and I utilized that when we designed the baits for Nico. Um, I, um, I I actually had a project, a uh, management consulting project for the Toyota Motor Company. And uh, I was assigned to provide a project that nobody had ever done before, completely unique, and based on my experience and my own thoughts. When are you going to do an autobiography of your life? Because I will read it. <laughs> so, but so I had to. I spent months. I mean, I studied everything, you know, from rock gardens to tea ceremony to charcoal, to how do they get four million people through a train station in a day? Um, it, it, you know, studied all those things and I have to condense that all down to a, a various concepts studied language, how your brain functions. Um, and I learned, I was able to distill what it is that they do. And I kind of keep that secret because I utilize that in Nico Bates. Hmm. When I design a bait, 
Um, I, I, I think a lot of the viewers or people who have used Nico before, um, I think a lot of them would say that they're, they, they feel they're more effective than other baits, other plastics. And part of that is because a little bit of this magic, when I say magic, it's not really magic, but it's, it's an understanding you, when you, if you understand Japan, if you approach it in a certain way, you can understand fish. I know that sounds really strange. No, it doesn't. Because, uh, guys, so, again, for the viewers that have been with me from day one, you know that I have always been huge on, on the Japanese culture when it comes mm -hmm. to fishing and stuff because so many of the techniques that we know, it starts from Japan, California, and then eventually it gets to Alabama. Mm -hmm. But it always starts there. And I really think it, it's it's a culture and it's a mindset difference that when you watch those anglers mm -hmm. fish, it, especially the ones that come <clears throat> over here, their whole approach is different. And when you had some of them and they would translate, it's like we only have, like, one lake in our country. Mm -hmm. And so... It, it's highly pressured. It's a different culture and a different approach to fishing. And then when they come over here, they're like kids in a candy shop. Cause like, Oh my, you have like all these places to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now just one core concept is that <clears throat> Japanese, um, are both typically both left brain and right brain. They can switch between them. And so that's very common for them. So for example, the Japanese language is a right brain language where most of your activities are left brain. So they're, they're utilizing and exercising both simultaneously. Mm. Um, English is a left brain language. And then we're, we're so heavily dependent on our left brain in daily life that we here in America, we almost never use our right brain. Whereas Japan, it's an everyday occurrence. And so a lot of the concepts, they see things different. Um, I, I personally am a, have a, have a mixture of both. And so I fit in really well with Japan. I understood when you sit there and look at what they're doing, you reach a level of understanding that a lot of times is, is very difficult to explain. Is that something you can train yourself on or is that something that you're either born with or you're not? Um, I think you can alter it a little bit. I think fundamentally it's probably who you are. Um, it probably depends on your age. Um, I'm not an expert in switching, you know, oh, your, yeah, yeah. Your, how much you use of each, but I do know you can exercise both um and so yeah so when we design baits when i'm in and just to let the viewers know um a, a lot, almost all of nico's new baits are all tested and designed on the shenandoah hmm. and um so that's where i do most of my testing I, I fish one stretch of river that i fished since 1972 as a kid um i have a good feel for it um i feel i see things a little bit different than everybody else so you, you took that japanese culture and then they since you to us back to us or like i guess because then you just said like so you were in japan but then you test stuff on the shenandoah so um no so i was started working for nico um 2010 and the two in march 11th 2011 the second largest earthquake ever recorded hit i was in that um in, fa in fact it was probably about 10 minutes after i had a meeting with nico i'm like fukushima reactors like yeah that all that deal. stuff um i was there Mm. And um, <laughs> I had to walk 18 miles to get home um, mm. and loafers. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Carrying mm -hmm. a briefcase. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, at that point, um, I had a better understanding of what was going on at Fukushima. Um, I went to the University of Tokyo and it was Ivy League. So all of my classmates were in the government agency. So they contacted me and gave me the real story of what was happening. And uh, I decided maybe I had two boys there. One's playing baseball. I didn't want him sliding into all the dust that was contaminated. So I figured it would be a good time to come back to the States and mm. maybe start figuring out how to work work with Nico in the fishing industry in the U.S. And then you come back here, and then that ties into to you guys, Jake's, where this relationship formed because you are, um, mm -hmm. based on what we said earlier, the first company or the first business in America to have Nico. Is that how it, That's right. You're the, you know, Jake's Bait and Tackle is the number one earliest um, store to carry Nico products. And then, and then with that said, guys, and now that we've really laid the groundwork, you know, we can get into the baits because I really do understand context and anything in life is so important mm -hmm. and to understand the mindset, the culture of like, why, why is, is Nico and some of these Japanese country, these co companies so important to the mm -hmm. fishing industry specifically? It's a cultural difference. It's right. a mindset difference of why this stuff works. Mm -hmm. um, and then what I think is fascinating, what you just said is <clears throat> now you're taking this cultural mindset and you're applying it in development on the Shenandoah. 
correct? Right. Yes. That, that's fascinating. So when I first started, um, I only had the baits that Nika had already designed. I had, I grew, like I said, I grew up fishing on the Shenandoah and I had a tadpole, a shrimp and an octopus. And I was catching more fish than I ever caught ever. And I, I made the mistake of thinking, well, all it takes is a bait that catches fish to sell mm -hmm. and to grow a market and start a business. Um, it's not the case at all. Um, people would not buy a shrimp, would not buy an octopus, mm -hmm. would barely buy in a tadpole, even though that could, that for me, it brought in more fish than I had ever brought in. And so that we're a little bit hard headed because results speak for themselves mm -hmm. and yet wasn't getting anywhere. Interesting. So we finally um, had to go back to square one and we looked around and essentially there was, you know, Nico concentrated on buggy, like realistic baits more so then than now. And um, the Helgramite, we came up with the Helgramite and I spent two years testing that on the Shenandoah and it's just a magical bait. How, <laughs> it just, it just how did it come around? Um, was it you guys got into like this think tank together to come up with the Helgramite? Like how did that come about? If, okay, if you so, want to talk about it. Yeah, when I first started out in the industry, um, I was a new, you know, a noob. A lot of people, I you know, kind of took advantage of me. Uh, I was really very, very naive. So I spent a lot of wasted time, um, hooked up with the wrong people, gave stuff away to the wrong people, was getting nowhere. And I decided to just kind of start over by myself. And what I did was I went to the uh, Trout Unlimited show here in Warrington, Virginia. Hmm. And the trout guys were amazing, very friendly. They just, they loved hearing about what we were doing. They were fascinated with what we were doing. We have, we have really small trout stuff. We have like stoneflies, mayflies, caddisflies as well. They love the environmental. The, these are the most environmentally friendly plastics out there and while we were talking to them you know i would tell my story and you know i'm really kind of trying to find my way here i'm getting frustrated um the baits work but people won't buy them i need mm -hmm. a bait that people will buy mm -hmm. and you talked to them and those guys were full of ideas very smart fellows and they said you know what how about a helgramite mm-hmm Nobody's done a good Helgramite ever. Bulb. Yeah, that's and uh, so that's where we started. And that's that's kind of what you're saying about culture too. Like that's what the river guys know. We know yeah. we know a Helgramite. We know a Mad Tom. You know the the what the smallmouth are eating in the river system. Now right. obviously they're eating a lot more things, but that's something you, you can Mad Tom. I you love, can ugh. relate to. You can relate to that because you like you say you grew up. I remember growing up pulling them rocks off the bottom and grabbing mm -hmm. that. Or live Helger might and then hooking right behind the hard shell there just don't let them pinch you but I've heard also heard guys say they put them in their hat you what? know and then they would because they'll latch onto their hair and they'll oh, God. that's where they would kind of no. keep them to you know but anyway point being that was I'm a natural bait tonight. that okay. we can relate to that you you right. can I'll buy that because I know that works yeah well with Nico's material <clears throat> they can go into more detail um, than U.S. manufacturers can mm. um so some of our baits, you actually need a, a little magnifying glass to see the details. Wow. Oh, that is so cool. You know, these these little wax worms. Um, you can't see it, but they actually have little pro legs and mouth parts. Get Seriously? Out of you can't see them until you get a magnifying glass. Oh, Nuts. That's cool. um, and there's, you know, the little feathering on the stonefly legs. Um, I call it feathering. I haven't really studied the anatomy. It might be gills of, of some sort. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, it's... it's there's a lot of detail there. So Nico could do that. So we, we worked with the Helgramite. Um, you know, people don't realize that the Helgramite is actually a composite of two different species. Really? Yeah. There's, um, there's the, oh gosh, on the spot, I can't remember the scientific name, but there's the Eastern Dobson fly here mm -hmm. in Shenandoah. It's about 90% of that. Mm -hmm. And there's another species that's so it has black wings. Um, it's not very well known. Um, but it had some key characteristics that, my Japanese design spidey senses figured would be a little better to incorporate. Um, my philosophy is that I want to mimic nature as closely as possible, but I purposely don't want to mimic, mimic it perfectly. You want slight adjustments. Slight adjustments. From, from it. Okay. Yeah. That, that is fascinating. And, and, and so honestly, I mean, 
How did you how did you want to do this? Did you how do you, go I would, let's let's or? start with that Helgramite since you're talking about it. Helgramite? And how are you rigging that? I know when guys come in, I usually show them two to three different ways that I like to rig it, but what what do you recommend as far as how to rig that for the river? Well, what I do, well, I'm I'm not going to necessarily recommend saying this is the best way. Mm. Um, to be honest, I think most of the customers who fish mm -hmm. Nico Helgramites probably putting them on Ned rigs. Okay. Um, I personally have never been a huge fan of the Ned rigs mm -hmm. fishing on the Shenandoah where I am. Um, personally, I felt that they were they they get snagged too easy. Oh, I vouch for that. Um, I hate them, guys. The, the hook quality is um, you know wear out the hook long before the Helgramite wears out. Mm -hmm. um, they tear up your baits when you try to change mm -hmm. them. Um, and the pricing wasn't there. So I thought, what a better, it must be a better way. So what I actually do is I just Texas rig them. Um, mm -hmm. out, I typically use a Gamakatsu G lock, uh, one aught hook and just Texas rig them like I would otherwise. And they're kind of weedless. It's a good idea. And it gets, it allows me to do pretty much anything you would want to do with a Ned rig. And, uh, You're you don't snag snagged. You're adding weight to it or is it I, weightless? Well, where I fish on the Chanel, it's pretty shallow. So I, I typically use a 1 16th ounce bullet weight. Okay. Um, I try to keep it simple. I don't want to design baits. I don't want to have to, I don't want customers to have to go buy all the specialty mm -hmm. gear just to fish my baits. I want the baits to catch fish no matter how you fish them. Mm -hmm. And so most of my fishing is really at the most simple basic level because that's where I can mm -hmm. gauge the effectiveness of the bait. Like, so if you're going out to fish that thing, like, are you throwing that thing on a extra heavy with, you know, 30 pound braid and are you just hopping it on the bottom? Like, how would you, <laughs> how would you throw that thing to maximize um, its success? Well, where I fish it in the water column depends on the day okay. mm -hmm. and the water levels. You know, uh, like I said, I fish uh, the shallow section of the Shenandoah. I usually don't need much weight to get it to where the fish are. Uh, most of the fish are three foot down. You know, if I can find a, um, actually, I'll, you know, we t this shows a lot of Shenandoah material on this show. You know, I can tell you that where I fish, the fish behavior has changed over the last several years. Um, there's no fish in all the deep holes. When I say deep holes, maybe five feet to say eight feet. Um, fish aren't there anymore. They they just I don't know if it's pressure or or what. Um, for the last, say, three or four years, all the fish have been in subsidiary holes um, near a current, but, but also near a deeper hole so that if they, re if they need to escape from their three to four foot, you know, secondary hole, mm -hmm. they have a deeper hole to go to. So that, that's behavior that has changed considerably since when I was growing up fishing the Shenandoah. So three or four feet down, you don't need to do a whole lot. Mm. You know, you're on top of the fish anyway. Mm -hmm. um, when I need to go down deeper, um, I'm kind of lazy. I don't really change out I, on the river. I try not to change out much. I do have a lot of rods and reels with me. Um, Good man. <laughs> but uh, I, I'll just be more patient and just, just let it sit down on the bottom a little bit more. Uh, when you Texas rig it like that, I, I really don't get snagged very much. That is a good technique, Texas rig, because you're going to catch bigger fish on the bottom. I know I've done like a... 16th ounce ball jig the sickle hook type thing and i've i've kind of run it through so the hook is exposed at the top you know jigging but i've also taken that same hook and belly hooked it on the underside give it kind of think of a wacky style so as it flutters yeah. down through the column i uh, had a lot of luck up on the susquehanna and usually like in the summertime most of the times that thing will never even get close to the bottom they've already eaten it i mean oh, yeah. seriously attack it um yeah and eat it before it ever gets to the bottom. Yeah, I I, I rarely <clears throat> have to let a bait sit on the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, it just maybe if I'm if the fish are still biting at the end of October or maybe in the early November, then I'll let it sit there. But usually don't have to wait very it's, long. Now I I don't have the background that that both of you do. Well, clearly, <laughs> it, it, with with the Helgramite um, growing up, I I was the tube guy, sort of speak. Mm -hmm. um, is the Helgramite a a a seasonal bait where it's better certain times of year or is it something that you fish year round or does it become second place different times of year? I think fall is typically your summer to fall. I think fall naturally they're under the rocks. They'll eventually, and I don't know if that cycle is throughout the year where they're going to 
emerge and have wings and fly but so the my answer would be any time of the year and the reason is because the elgar mite was the first bait i designed it's the first bait we came into the u.s um i have fished this bait every month of the year um i can I'll, i will testify to the fact that fish will hit this bait anytime mm-hmm. um you know, it goes back to your the bait design and what triggers fish to bite. There's a lot of criteria. If you understand that, um, the seasons no longer matter. I know that sounds right. strange because you'll, right. there's a lot of people um, on TV cashing big checks that will tell you otherwise. Mm-hmm. But it does not matter. Um, if you design a good bait, fish will hit that any time of year. Mm-hmm. Um, whether it's if you design a good bait, it will catch fish in salt water or fresh water. Um, because the when you get down and you go into the science of what triggers bites, um, you can you can look at it from, you know I know some of your guests have t- like have talked about the profile, the mm-hmm. action. Mm-hmm. Um, you can even get into the amino acids that they mm-hmm. sense, you know, and and we go down rabbit holes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um, you know, I I I I know guides that will say, well, we're not fishing the helgramite. You know, maybe some guides in there. We're not fishing the helgramite until July. Because the helgramites are when you come crawling, the, the adult, not adult, they're still larvae, but the mature larvae, when they're crawling out before they pupate into dobson flies, you know, then, you know that's, that's typically, I believe, in July around here. And so once, once they start crawling out of the rocks, everyone wants to fit, you know, match the hatch. And um, I think match the hatch really originated from poorly designed baits. Hmm. Um, or I shouldn't say poorly. I, I baits that had more room for improvement. Mm-hmm. And if you if you understand the difference of that extra that just that extra little bit to make a good bait, um, you're you're triggering the fish at a at a genetic level. It's embedded in their DNA mm-hmm. what they want. All you have to do is present that to them. Mm-hmm. Um, and if they're if you have a match the hat situation where they're just chomping on something, they're not really looking. They're just anything similar. They're grabbing. So, is the difference between a helgramite, a Ned rig, and the tube? Is it all angler mentality, or is there something to the, the differences in the presentation? At certain, like it sounds like you're saying, I, I could be wrong. I'm just trying to. Well, for me, the helgramite, I, I present the helgramite tons of different ways. Okay. So I, I don't. We don't have a tube. We don't make a tube. I have a really nice tube designed on paper sitting on my desk, but. Um, you know, we, I, I, it's, I don't know if we're going to do a tube. Um, You'd be wise to. Well, we, we, <laughs> there's I, a market. We <laughs> um, saying. So, you know, a lot of the baits we design now are um, can be utilized like tubes or can be utilized like right. net rigs. Um, but for the Helgramite, I mean, it's it's a very super versatile bait. Mm. You know, I, you can present it so many different ways. You know, this past year, we had a lot of um, uh, wild celery in the river. And you couldn't make a cast without bringing in some celery. Mm-hmm. And so it was top water for me for the last couple months of the season. Hmm. Um, so, you know, the fish love it, top water. Um, and, you know, it just, for me, every time I go out fishing, it's an opportunity to learn. I'm not, I can consider every catch a blessing and uh, every every fish, every fish is a chance to learn. And I think they would, they would eat all three, but I think, too, the thing about the hugger mine, I don't think a lot of people are throwing them. So if you're looking at something too that is natural that they're eating that there is not the tube is the predominant kind of the, the kind of a crayfish type of imitation yeah. so, so tubes is... well obviously tubes don't <clears throat> exist in nature right? right they don't look like crayfish you can say well the the, the tentacle parts mm-hmm. mimic a crayfish um and that gets into this various decision criteria right. for what triggers a bite so you're, you're. So I want you to talk about that too, since you brought it up again, and then in that I want to hear about color because you got different colors. Colors. So and what you, color do you throw? But at, throw that in with what? Because you twice you've said that, and I'm curious what about the decision your, criteria. About your criteria. Yeah. Well, there's, in not any particular order, there's profile, proportions, actions, vib, uh, your frequency of vibrations. You've got uh, your the sense. Um, those are probably the big, the top five. Was then, color in there anywhere or no? Oh yeah, color, sorry. Six. That's fine. No, I was thinking two. Yeah. Like, wait, okay. <laughs> um, the, the thing is with color, um, I personally, 
place less emphasis on color than most people. I would agree. I yeah, I think it. I think you you did you coin it like uh, colors catch catch anglers, not fish. Yeah, like I, mean, well, I think it's it's no. The, well, there's certain things about. It. I mean, if you're fishing for crappie, um, I've had days where crappie would only hit by small shrimp. I could put on. You know, we had about ten colors of shrimp at the time. I could put on nine colors and they wouldn't hit it. And put on one other color and they'll hit it. Um, you can fish for trout, stock trout in streams in Pennsylvania or the maybe the little trout ponds at fishing shows. And you'll notice, if you, if you pay attention, the trout go through about an hour and a half to three hour cycles of what color they like. Hmm. How did you figure that out? That's you just You just observe. That's free. Oh. And so <laughs> color does matter to certain species. Mm -hmm. they, they go through the little rhythms. Um, on the Shenandoah, especially in clear water, um, color matters. Um, you know, the fish are very visual. Um, you know, they don't have refrigerators. So they don't can't go to the, they don't have a Costco, so they can go to for food. They have to make a split second decision as something washes by them. And so color is part of their criteria. So I have colors um, that work and don't work on my section of the river that I fish. Um, now, when I go to fishing shows, I'll, I have people saying, well, three miles down the river, they love pink. Well, in the section I fish, I don't catch as many fish on pink. And, and what is pink? I mean, that's, I wonder too if shade, I mean, yeah. I agree pink works, but what out there in nature is pink? I, I think mean, it's silhouette. I think it's I think a silhouette. It, yeah. it casts. I it, it could be. Well, it's, it's. And it could be shade, but. but yeah, that, it, and I love these, and I love these conversations too, yeah. because it's, it's a man's perception or opinion right of what the fish is and i would agree when you look at spectrum i agree also that color is going to yeah. be down on that i think the other ones will take precedence right. well just you know I, I fish a shallow section of the shenandoah river the water is typically very clear pinks purples oranges and reds are not good colors for me hmm. everything else is and so um interesting but the another interesting fact is that pinks will statistically bring in larger fish for me fewer fish but larger um, hmm. every time it's been that way for the last three or four years. That is fascinating. You know, I will, if I fish pink and some other more of a natural color side by side, I'll, I typically get about 30% fewer fish on the pink. But if I took the, if I did the stats, they would average probably about three quarters of an inch larger. Interesting. Um, it's, it's just, just, you know, things you learn every you know, time. when you're in, the, when you're fishing for fun, you may not pick up on these things, but mm -hmm. I'm in the bait business. Mm -hmm. Right. And you, you get really fine tuned for a lot of things and you just learn. And, and but for color, for largemouth, um, I, I've caught large, well, I've caught fish on every single bait. I've caught smallmouth on every single bait that I have pretty much, you know, except for six inch giant crabs. But, um, uh, but, for largemouth and smallmouth, I've caught, caught them on every single color. I fish every single color. Um, you know, I need to be able to understand the behavior. I, and I also need to be able to understand when I go to Tennessee or Florida and, and people talk to me, I need to have an understanding of, you know, the, the, the behavior that that's there. And I was just thinking, too, I got to throw this out here, because you, you're, talking about, you're talking, talking about shrimp and the squid, but um, I know young man that Colby – they were catfishing at night, and another guy I knew was using shrimp for catfish. So he's, you know, catfishing, catching them on shrimp, freshwater lake. You know, there's no shrimp mm -hmm. in there. He throws out catfishing and catches a four pounds largemouth, right? So back to that, I mean, that profile, that, but, but it does have that natural, that smell, taste whatever so i mean yeah, just again from what our right. what we perceive and what fish yeah. are going to eat is not doesn't always match up yeah so a lot of this information is embedded in the <clears throat> fish's dna you know how do how do ducks and geese know to fly south in the winter mm -hmm. that information is embedded in their dna because there's somebody one of their ancestors long 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 ago mm. figured that out and part of my studies in japan was actually actually part of my projects i worked on was actually how information is embedded in dna Hmm, and that was that's that so freaking cool <laughs> it's it's so it really happens and i think it was probably in 2000 <laughs> probably around 2004 2005 i remember reading a study where scientists had been able to actually demonstrate and document 
information being encoded in DNA of a living organism. And so, um, you know, if you go to uh, a, a body of water that doesn't have helgramites, you know, like uh, Lake, you go to Lake Anna. They don't have a lot of helgramites in Lake Anna. Mm -hmm. Put on a helgramite, you'll catch a lot of fish. Mm -hmm. Why do they do it? Because that information is embedded in their DNA. And that and makes all sense. All you have to do is yeah. access that. It's like um, when when you have the brood X, when you have the cicada boom. Mm -hmm. True. They, they don't always eat cicadas. I haven't seen it for 17 years. But when so. it happens, all of a sudden, all those fish, mm -hmm. like, you know, like uh, Travis Eden of Kingfishing Adventures, or Kingfishing Adventures, um, talked about fly fishing for carp, specifically having to mimic a cicada. That has to be embedded in their genetics mm -hmm. to be able to understand that that's a food source that is available mm -hmm. to us at certain times. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. that's just absolutely fascinating. And, and besides like you have some other baits too. Um, did you right. want to, did you want to, and real well, quick too, though, that, that Texas rig Helger might made me think too. um, run a polymer knot, run extra long tag in, run it back through and drop shot that some oh, of the yeah. gun yeah. Yep. would be great too. Cause it's going to keep it right off the, but yeah, absolutely. Well, the Helger might is a bait that it's almost impossible to fish wrong. Um, right. Good you point. can, you can wacky rig them, fish them top water, Texas rig them, Ned rig them, yep. Carolina rig them. And, um, no wrong way to do it. There's, there's really no wrong way to do it. So what else do you have there? So the other bait I, that I fish side by side with the algramite is a leech. Hmm. So the leech was, we originally wanted a, a, a drop shot bait. I started thinking about a worm. But then I also realized um, I'd like to go for something a little more of a natural profile. Um something that we excel at a little bit better. So I actually went to the leech. I looked at leeches, and similar to the Helgramite, um, I didn't really think there were really, really good leech-style baits out there. Um, or at least I thought I could do better. And so um, I came up with uh, the leech right here. And this bait, uh, certainly this year for me, it's a, it's a relatively new bait. Um, I mean, this bait will went one for one with the Helgramite much of the time. Hmm. It's hard to beat the Helgramite, um, but this was, for me, a very successful bait. And, and how are you fishing the leech? I typically fish it the same way I do a Helgramite. Okay. Um, if you put on a Gamakatsu one out G-Lock mm -hmm. in a 16th ounce bullet mm -hmm. weight, Makes sense. you can fish almost everything I have. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm kind of lazy. I want to go fishing. I don't want to be sitting there tying knots. You're just changing out your different... I, I'll yeah. change out a bait. That's cool. And and again, I have to study baits. Um, I'm more studying baits than I am techniques. Um, hmm. You know, in a shallow section river, I think technique's probably a little less important overall because you're always on the fish mm -hmm. if you know where they are. Um, and so I'm changing out baits more than I do techniques. Could we also talk about your Ned rig? Because I think that's, I've been staring at that morsel <laughs> okay. the whole time. The Ned rig right, right here. <laughs> so <laughs> if, uh, snort. We'll, we'll start off. First, I'll just start where it came from. So here's our bass worm. We, early in the program, you mentioned Nolan Miner mm -hmm. catching that, I think yep. 11 pound bass. Mm -hmm. it's, this is the worm he got it on. Um, that thing quivers so well, too. A, wow. a lot of people, this is a very unique worm. Um, it's the most versatile, most unique worm out, out there. There's a lot of different features going on with it. A lot of, there's a lot of things going on in this worm. But if you notice, the heads are very similar. Gotcha. They're not exactly because I actually altered the design a little bit for this one. Um, a lot of people loved this bass worm, and they would chop it in half. Hmm. And they would use the top half as a Ned rig, and they actually used the bottom half as well. And uh, they had a lot of luck with that. And so a lot of our customers were saying, you've got to design a Ned rig. And... Um, you know, Ned rigs is everybody's got a Ned rig. They're all just sort of simple, uh, pretty thin stick baits. And so we wanted to do it the Japanese way, take it to another level. Was, that's what I was going to ask you next. <laughs> it's like from a man who designed this intricate Helgamite, <laughs> emotionally, was this hard for you to have this concept like this? this chunk of plastic that does nothing. And it's like when you have this beautiful Helgramite that with these designs, yeah. it's like just a sausage bait. Like, I don't know. <laughs> well, no, I mean, no. Um, I mean, I've personally, I don't, although I grew up fishing baits, I guess what we would call Ned rigging now. Yeah. Um, very similar to current mm -hmm. Ned little stick baits. I've, I did that as a kid because I was always experimenting with stuff. Um, didn't have a name and I, you know, I never, it wasn't, I mean, I had, uh, back then, I probably had more success on a, a little beetle spin 
in a, in a rebel little short little rebel mm -hmm. plug I've not heard a Beale spell in a long time. That's, yeah, that's a... I mean that was magic when yeah, I was a kid. Yeah. And um, but I, but I fished little baits like chunks like this as well. And I, I never did quite as well, but I did play around with it. But anyway, um, what we decided to do was base a Ned rig off customers' feedback. They wanted that head. They loved that head. So what I did was I sort of changed the proportions and uh, and ribs a little bit to. Um, make it what I think is a little more to provide frequencies that they're more likely to experience in nature than ones that they aren't. Um, and there's, there's various, if you understand how these things work, there's, there are some frequencies that are more natural than others. And so this one is, I design in the hopes that it is more, more natural. So, um, I've got three, it's got three different zones. It's got the thick, um, ribs here. It's got the very fine ribs, and it's got this middle portion. It's called a clitella. Um, and so that's one thing that's unique. There's no other Ned rig, that Ned, little stick bait like this. So it, it provides a range of vibrations that, that don't exist in other baits. I can tell because I, I have the Z-Man on my head. There's a huge difference between that, and I like what you're doing there with yeah. that. Um, so the other thing we did was... Um, everybody else's Ned rigged or the Ned stick baits, um, they're quite thin and we just, you know, fish don't, we wanted to provide something different. So we went with a thicker profile. So, you know, to give you an idea, this is, a, this is exactly the, ca if you're into ammo, it's a 45 caliber diameter. And so we went with a thicker profile. Now is thicker profile better than a thinner profile? Not necessarily. The thinner profiles have been really well established, um, very effective for a long time. But people who fish nids a lot will have should have this in their arsenal. And people who have fished nids a lot have contacted me and said they were glad they had this bait. Mm. Um, now I'm not going to tell you it's going to catch, you know, more fish than any other ned rig. Mm -hmm. I think it will, but not necessarily. Mm. But you, it, it's a different approach. It's providing the fisherman with a with a extra bit of ammo that he didn't that you can't get elsewhere. I, I think there's a time that the thickness does play. It really does. I and, like like yeah. And so and yeah, and, that, and that's one of the things we talked about a profile. So what triggers the fish to bite? So one is a a long thin profile is always good because that's a that's a that's a vulnerable profile. It's a snake. It's a worm, right? It's a leech. Mm -hmm. um, those things can't really fight back. They're easy prey. And then you have another approach is when you have thicker profiles, you're thinking guts, something that has, has more bulk to it. And then that's more nutrition. And so you, again, you know, it's what, it's just one of the criteria. It's just a different balance. We don't want to be like everybody else. So we went where nobody else has gone before. And we, that's the, our Ned bait. The other nice little thing, it's just a little Recess. attention to de detail. Mm -hmm. The end is recessed. So it snugs up onto the jig head really nicely. So what I also like about that too is if you want to, if you're a super glue person, I like that because that really locks it in there versus other heads on the market where if you do like to apply some super glue, it mm. like it just splats it everywhere. Mm. Versus that really kind of gets it. The, yeah. yeah. Yep. And so that's our. You know, we have five colors of those, and um, I'm gonna put a new color in uh, later on next year. Ooh. So, yeah. So those are the nets. And um, we call them, we couldn't think of the name. We, we couldn't decide on the name for the longest time. And finally we had 15 minutes. The, the guys in Japan says, you've got, you've got to finish. The, you've got to give me a name by the end of this phone call. Oh my gosh. No pressure. <laughs> All the names we came up with were either um, taken, had trademark issues. That's sick. And um, so, you know, Nico has a super shrimp and super this so we ended up with super ned i mean it's really um a sad story of not coming up That's with right. a good name but uh we call it so the nico super ned what is another like bait that has a good story attached with its creation um because there's so many on this table and i don't like a kid in the candy store i want to talk about all of them well we could but you know um as far as creation goes i, I think the craw maybe mm -hmm. um and you can hold that up to the camera so we, we can show people what, what you're talking about. Yeah, here's the, here's the Nico Craw. Um, again, we wanted to 
th this is a bait that is a put a lot. It was a lot of fun developing this particular bait hmm. because it was very similar to the development of the uh, Helgramite. Mm -hmm. We had, um, if you look at the crawls on the market, almost all of them are designed to mimic crawls from Louisiana. Oh my God, that is such a cool detail. Um, but if you look around at the distribution of crawls, of course they're everywhere. Mm -hmm. You look at the then you look at the population of fishermen and where they fish. Nobody has a crawl that mimics where most of the population actually fishes. And so um, that was one thing we went with. So uh, where the most distinguishing feature between a southern crawl and a northern or midwestern crawl is the claws themselves. So the shape of the claws. And um, that's where you really, the detail comes in. And so this was a bait. Um, I was uh, I was looking at websites and databases from all the universities around in the U.S., looking up all of the, getting all the pictures of uh, all the of the crawls that I could find, researching all the different species, where they are, um, trying to get a blend of features that I could model that would incorporate different, you know, proportions and, mm -hmm. and shapes so that this crawl would be effective across a very wide geography. And I didn't want to just a purely uh, southern crawl that everybody else does. Mm. And so that was one thing that was, that, that, act, that part of this project was actually probably the most fun. Now, do, do you just send them pictures or do you send them like carcasses of all the different ones? To well, you can't because of phyto, phytosanitary reg, regulations. Okay. You can't be just sending dead animals yeah. or parts of dead animals across countries' borders. Mm. Um, so in this case, what I would do was. You guys can come sit down. They can't see you. Okay. Yeah, there. So what I would. So, so what I would do for this case is I would take as many photographs of, well, I would take as many pictures as I could find, and I would start measuring. I'm getting the measurements, finding proportions that I wanted, um, something that would be representative and something still natural. And uh, and that's the way we came across this uh, particular design. And, and there's various ratios that we look at. Um, so... You know, for the claws, we, we chose one, a claw that would be very common from, say, north of, uh, say, let's say, North Carolina upwards, northwards, all across the upper, upper, upper right-hand corner of the U.S. So then um, the other thing we did was, um, you know, because of our material, we can do the long antennas. You know, the antennas are actually a hmm. natural resting angle for, you know, they're very commonly, if you just see a crawfish just sitting there. Hmm. You try to measure his angles of his antenna. So we try to get as close to that as we can. Um, it's slightly adapted because there's production issues with molds and, and such. Um, we, um, the, the other cool thing we did was the body angles. It's very difficult to see. You'll hear a lot of people talking about a, a, a claw or a crawl that is a, a defensive position. Mm -hmm. um, but if you actually look at the crawls, none of them are in defensive positions. They might have their tail folded back, but their 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 claws are straightforward. They're actually in a swimming position. Um, their antenna are short and straight. So what we did was, uh, well, first of all, what we did was, if you can see this, our claws are at a wide angle. These are very wide crawls. So this this crawl is always at a defensive position, um, but because of the material, it's so soft and it. it the collapsibility in the fish's mouth, these wide claws don't interfere with, with the hookup where traditional plastics, you may have that problem. In all your research, what are the typical color patterns of crayfish in this area? <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> that, uh, that's a tough question. It's I mean, ever changing. It, it changes and it's like, what's bubble gum, right? What's pink? You know, you, you people, everyone looks at these things differently. I have mm. people telling me there's black Helgramites. Black's a big seller for me because a lot of people think Helgramites are black. Um, I've never seen a black Helgramite. Mm -mm. um, I'm sure they get pretty dark in some areas. but um, So for me, um, typically, as we mentioned earlier in the broadcast, I'm, I'm not a big, I, I don't, you know, I put color pretty far down on the list of criteria. So I'm not a big color 
guy on on that. So I I typically stick with anything that's sort of natural looking, you know, greens, browns, blacks. Yeah, um, and for our area, it seems like a green pumpkin is. If you look at, I mean, I'll we'll catch crawfish and or you see that's what roger did when he with all his jig patterns he's yeah he's taking them out of the potomac river shander river he's yeah. taking them out and seeing now different times of year but most of them are going to be a base green pumpkin they might have some orange tint blue tint, right different a little bit orange and blue yeah and that's what i mean it's like in all your research did you see like some some patterns between the crayfish from the shando to the to to the carolinas and all over um in your observations no i mean what no not really because okay. you're looking at representative photographs Gotcha. Um, mm-hmm. It's very difficult to to get a seasonal photograph of every species in every region mm-hmm. <laughs> throughout the year. You know, you're just getting representative photographs, and and usually those are collected when they're most easily accessible. And I think that's probably when a lot of college st- uh, researchers are working in the summertime. You know, interesting. You know, another thing you don't think about too is the color in the water and the color out of the water. You take something out of the water, man, it takes on a totally different color. Or how many times you, you take a bait here and you throw it in the water and you're like, holy smokes, look at the yeah. change of color on that yeah. dude. Yeah. So anyway, this, this bait was fun. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but the, the body angles, this is a, this is, this the angle is designed at the moment before the crayfish flees. Hmm. So he's already flexed his muscles. He's hunched up, ready to go. He's got the claws out. He's, you know, so we did everything we could in here to make this a, using the concept of a vulnerable prey. And we did that. Um, is that based on taking a ton of photographs and being like, "This is the right defensive position"? Well, motion? there was a little bit of little bit of guesswork in some of it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. We we had um, we had some photographs. We went out and actually caught some crayfish, and um, tried to you know tantalize or not tantalize, you know antagonize them. I should say, um, you know, and see when so they fun. hunch up, <laughs> and you, fun then you try to you know you try to get a visual image of that, and then you try to put that on paper. And send it off to Japan for design. That's but so you cool. hear him talking. I've I've seen video on that. You're talking about the Japanese design and just the the intricacy of the mm-hmm. like the geometry. And you talk a lot about proportions and ratios and just it's amazing. Like even their jerk baits, like everything they do is based on that kind of almost not a perfect number, but you know what I'm saying. Definitely, right. definitely a yeah. so, a natural. Yeah. Yeah. So the other the other thing is really cool about this bait is each crayfish is actually unique. So you'll get a pack of crayfish. The chances of getting the same crayfish is actually oh, that's unusual. Wild. So each mold cavity is unique. It has its own characteristics. And um, so I, I'm a fir- very firm believer that fish can, they know a lot more about their environment than we think they do. Mm-hmm. So if you, if they're hitting crayfish, let's say you lose a fish. And a lot of times if you go right back with the same bait, they won't hit it. At least that's my experience on the Shenandoah. It's hard to get the fish to come back once you hook them. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why I carry leeches and helgramites. I always have the same rig rigged up, one of each. Because if I miss them on a helgramite, I'll throw a leech and get Smart. the same fish. Um, for the crayfish, um, you know, we're trying to appeal to a broader market um, with that. You know, I, I, it's hard to substi- substitute one of our baits for the crayfish. So what we did, we'll subs- you can substitute another crayfish. Mm-hmm. And by doing that, you'll get a bait that's actually slightly built different. That's so cool. And so that may mean the margin of catching a fish. And so that's what we did. Are you Texas rigging that also? Um, for me personally, um, I like I, I just like an ordinary jig head. Just an ordinary mm. collarless ball jig head. Um, I use a variety of them. I mean, I'll, I'll anything with a weight and a hook, I'll put on. I, I experiment and try all the time. I... I have luck that way, um, because of the buoyancy and bulk of this pro- of this um, crawl. You will not get snagged nearly as much as you think you will with an exposed hook, even in even in rocky, shallow water in, hmm. in the Shenandoah. Hmm. Um, a lot of my customers will Texas rig it, have an offset hook, and this bait has a uh, a slit in the back. It also has I've engineered a little slit in the back here, so when you have the uh, the the 90 degree neck on the thing you can also bring it right through there nice and easy um but a lot of the customers will texas rig it with an offset hook and fish it kind of weedless mm-hmm. and uh they do well with it um i didn't um you know it's just the individual variability where you fish mm-hmm. what works for you and for me an exposed hook is has just outfished the 
the Texas rig on this mm-hmm. one. And, and when you're talking about molds, and maybe this is a good time to talk about that, if you want to, which is um, there's another Helgramite possibly coming out, correct? That's right. And then, guys, you know, above my head here, you know, I'll, it'll be uh, an image will show up about this new bait that's coming to market. Yeah, well, we're going to have a, a new Helgramite coming out. Um, it'll it'll be a different size, of course, and we also incorporated another feature to give it a little more action. And uh, and it will probably be in a slightly different plastic as well, again, to get a little more action. So our current Helger mites are, um, even though they're, you know, they, they're not known for a lot of action, it's a relatively stiff bait. Um, hasn't, done a, hasn't done anything to hurt the, the uh, fish catching ability because that, the, the Helger mites just magic. But with a larger bait, we felt we needed a little more action. And uh, we had a little better collapsibility when the fish bites it. So we uh, we're, we're come, we we've been working on that. We should have that in probably the end of January, early February. Wow. Okay. Awesome. So, and so then, stay tuned. And uh, Jake's will be will probably be, you know, true to history. <laughs> will probably be the number one store to carry one. And then, guys, again, as always, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today. Um, you know, link links to, to Jake's online. If you could, guys, that'd be really good to help them out. You can order from them. Uh, also, there'd be links to everything that we talked about today. So why why this? It's Winnow, right? The Winnow, yes. Winnow. Why Winnow over a Kytec or every other brand of swim bait out oh there? Oh, my gosh. Uh, this is a bait that has a lot of depth. Um, so... Um, People have been asking us, once people used our products and they said, you've got to use, you've got to make a rib swim bait. Um, you know, a lot of people, you know, the, the, the other swim baits, they're good for maybe one fish or, or two fish, maybe three. Mm-hmm. Some of them good for zero if they nip the tails off. <laughs> and, you know, with the, with our material, we could make a bait that would be very durable. So, I mean, the first thing is the durability. So you can stretch these. You know, you're not going to lose the tails. So number one you're not you're going to spend a lot less money a lot less time rigging a lot less time cussing um you know you'll have more time fishing um so that was the number one thing but again when you look at swim baits um they're all the same design basically you know um i think the leader who is kitech they got they got the softness the action Mm -hmm. The ribs, they they got a, so much right with that bait. It's they really were the first on the market, right? Like it was like Bastrix than them, mm-hmm. I think. I, I don't yeah. know all the history, but yeah, I, I don't know the history yeah. either. Um, I just know that they're amazing bait, <laughs> <laughs> and and you know we said, well, how would we make a better swim bait? That's a, that's a very difficult thing to do. Um, so we set out to look at all the different features of what a swim bait should have. And so number one is durability. We have that through the material. Mm-hmm. Um, the other one is action. Again, we have we we can get that with a, a paddle tail. It's easy to get action. Um, and the material, if you look at that, how that just bait just collapses. It's so easy to get yeah. action. Um, and at the time, we also realized that um, swim baits were being used more and more um, earlier in the season and later in the season, meaning cold water. And the so we designed a, we said well no bait is specifically been designed for slow retrieve so let's let's do that we have the materials we have the plastic we have we have everything we need to do to design a bait that can extend the fishing season could, yeah. could you like and i this is i'm i'm gonna just my heart's exploding here i love this so much um this is so important because i follow like all the swim bait underground and how important the plastic softness is in cold water and why that, that is like, that's. Okay. Oh yeah. So, yeah, you know, so <laughs> we, a lot of times we just live in our own bubble. We're kind of like a little bit of a, there's a little small academic part of us and we just get in our mind to design something. And to be honest, we don't really pay attention to a lot of things. Um, and so we, anyway, anyway, this is a very easy, just, you can see it's a very a slow retrieve. Um, you can fish it in cold water. Um, the other thing is our baits remain softer in colder temperatures than traditional plastic. So, you know, as far as the, as long as the fish are biting, you can keep fishing this bait in colder and colder water. You'll get more, you'll get more action out of this plastic than you will traditional plastics at, at cold temperatures, which also makes these very good for ice fishing as well. Um, and the other thing is you can see the collapsibility 
Mm -hmm. um, so no matter how you rig this bait or you're fishing it, you want good collapsibility because there's a lot of bulk here. You don't want the bait getting in the way of a hook set. Um, so the other problem we had was, well, we can design a bait for slow retrieve, but what about quick retrieve? So, you know, you can dra you can rip the bait and if it's turning on its side or flipping over, you, you don't want that. So I came up with a keel on this bait. Hmm. So it's kind of hard to tell, but you can see there's a swollen hmm. belly here. That is brilliant. This belly and then plus there's a triangular shape. So I, I modified the profile to be like a boat. And it's a little triangular. And mm. I also, again, used angles and proportions and everything to try to get this as close to nature as I could so that these that these angles and, and such are not broadcasting something unusual. So the last thing, mm. that's not actually the last thing, there's a lot going on in here. Um, no, go for it, yeah. I, the, I love um, this. If you notice the zigzags, the zigzags mm. go all the way around. So as it turns out, it's impossible to make a mold in the traditional sense, with zigzags going all the way around the bait. Hmm. Um, well, I shouldn't say it's impossible, but the mold would probably cost $100,000. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So for all practical purposes, you would be, you know, they would be getting little drill bits and drilling, and the, the drill bits are, and you know, in case of this one, they're less than, you know, like half a millimeter or less. Um, and you, the way they drill those, you would be replacing a drill bit. They said something like every 45 seconds. Hmm. Um, and so you can't do that. Do you have an Can I see that too? Like, I'm like, my eyes are old. So, so I keep talking or? Yeah, 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 you can go back. I just want to look, like, quick, look at this. So I can give it a quick memorization. Okay, in the field. I'll, I'll leave it here. Oh, and then catch. Perfect. Now, so the, now I'm uh, on board. So, so we wanted zigzags. So why did we want zigzags? It's because zigzags, and if you well, let me back up. So the zigzags transition to straight. So we have a wide range of frequency vib you know, the vibration the frequencies of the vibrations. We are is broadcasting a like a full spectrum of vibrations. So if you look at the other baits, they're all straight. They're all straight because it's they're really easy to manufacture. Now if you get and when but when they're straight, it's a monotone presentation. You're broadcasting one frequency. Because of the the because of the period of those those vibrations of the rib. So you're mimicking the secondary action that you would see on a full body swim bait, where you have like the gill flares and everything else. There, you're able to mimic kind of that that roll yeah. and bob. Yeah, we also do that because the, the because our material these these ribs actually flex too. Ah. So I mean, so first of all, it broadcasts its 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 presence. So if you're at like for example, when testing with this bait, um, a lot of the testing happened in winter actually and uh, when fishing was slow and all the guys would fish traditional swim baits um, of various top brands mm -hmm. and they would fish this and you know they would maybe not catch a fish all day because they're fishing in winter time but they would get a hit on this or they may catch one fish all day and it would be this and so you know that was part of it was the vibrations you want to broadcast so the fish don't hit a swim bait every day because there's a lot of things that the fish we don't know what's going through their minds. Um, or if you're on the right frequency, if that's something that turns them on, then you'll they'll, you'll get a look, you'll get a chase, maybe get a kick, maybe get a catch. Um, so this one, so this bait is designed to cover this full spectrum. So it's a very wide casting, a very wide frequent range of frequencies. The fish know it's there, and you're much more likely to hit on a frequency that the fish are tuned in on. With this, because you because you got a wide variation, hmm. um, and the the ribs flex. So while it's going, the, you know, it's a very soft material. The ribs are flexing. So again, it provides a, another aspect of the action. It's another, I, I guess, layer to it where um, it provides a real image. And um, you know, I mean, the other thing we did was this belly. You know, if you uh, if you observe nature. Um, You'll notice if you watch bears eating salmon or minks eating muskrats or various things, you'll notice that they always go for the, the highest nutritional value portion of the prey first. And uh, so we put a swollen belly. That belly acts as not only a keel, but also acts to add what we think is going to try to send a message that there's additional nutritional value here. And you try to get a, a fish more likely to strike. Hmm. I'm going to have to add that to my re repertoire. 
you know, I'm huge on fishing winter swim baits and like my, my old favorite is like the American trash fish where it's actually like a carcass mold of one and it's super soft plastic and no other company made plastic like that. But it's, it's basically, you got to make the order. And so you can't get them in bulk. It's very hard to get them. And if they die, you're, you're screwed. That looks like it might yep. replace me, replace American trash fish for me. Yeah. So the other thing we did was, um, just by the way, um, the diameter right below, right behind the head is such that it fits on very, very nicely with most of the jig heads are on the market. Um, so it doesn't look abnormal. Um, and another thing we did, we put, it's like a little chevron or crisscross design on the tail. Not only does this, pro again, provide even additional, a different range of frequencies as well, but it also provides markings so that if you want to tone this bait down, mm -hmm. um, you, you can clip the tail. Um, and these markings help you remember what where you liked it. Um, hmm. So if you want to do that frequency or frequently. You, frequently. you and Nico are so detail oriented. Have you ever thought about getting more into the swim bait culture with, with different products at some point? Because it feels like that's a match made in heaven. Um, well, we're not short on ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> you know, we're a small company. Um, our presence in the U.S. is small. We're a very small team. Really? Uh, we're super small. We're much smaller than people realize. Um, and so, and then the other thing is Nico has a unique manufacturing process. It's very unlike everybody else's. Um, we, there's certain bottlenecks and constraints that we have that people are not aware of or don't understand. And that manifests itself in some baits we can do a little more efficiently than others. Um, and we have to make adjustments sometimes for production purposes. How does, and I, I don't think we've gotten into this, how does the conversation work if you wanted to do a new bait? So blank bait, is it like you pitch the idea and then you guys deliberate for a couple of years? Like, is it a long process to figure out what's new? Um, it's not as long as it used to be. The first time I did a new bait was took two years and that was oh. the Helgramite. Okay. Um, I remember the last, the finally, we, we then I hadn't designed the bait before. Nico didn't put me through the regimented process either. They were quite generous with me. And I would say, I want this, I want this. Um, and I could, I had, I didn't, my demands on what I presented were a lot lower. And so they figured out what I wanted and made it. Um, now I have to present a rather complete design. Oh, wow. Um, now they'll still re they'll still put it through a, a different designer who will put it through the computer and, you know, to my specs, you know, we, we typically do things to, uh, um, typically to point or one tenth of a millimeter okay. when I'm doing things. Um, so the process is normally we want to bait that will become popular. I mean, we want people to be happy. We want fit people fishing our baits. Um, we have a lot of cool stuff that would be niche baits. Mm -hmm. Um, niche baits tend to cost more um we we what we need now is we are really looking for a little bigger footprint in the market so that we can come back to those niche those niche baits that makes sense okay so you know our most of our recent baits are, are rather more traditional or simple um because a lot of people won't buy a brand that they're not familiar with mm -hmm. if it's a niche product and that's just reality um i would i, I have a long list of things i'd like to make and um i know what i want to make um, do you have but, a bucket list idea in your head? You don't have to tell us, but do you have like a, Oh, a, a oh yeah, absolutely. List? Okay. Absolutely. Um, cool. I have, I have two baits that I think would be, well, probably three that I think would be really, really cool. Um, and, um, yeah, but it, it's, it's a, it's a process. I, I design it on paper, um, present it. Um, we have to budget for it. Mm. I have to present, uh, studies. I have to study the market make, come up with estimates on, how much we would sell for how much. Then we kind of know what we can afford on the molds and then in the production process. And we just try to, you know, there's a lot of conflicting, like anything, there's, you know, you got production guys saying, we don't want to do that. Or mold manufacturers saying, we can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then, then they come back with stuff and saying, well, if you do that, I can't sell it. Wow. Two yeah. years. I mean, that's so crazy when you think about that. That simple hug might that's yeah. a two-year process. So another market we have here that's uh, in our area and here at Jake's, we sell a lot of like your, your trout guys, like your oh your yes. little trout uh, things here. If you want to talk about that a little bit. Um, well, first of all, we have 
caddisflies, mayflies, and stoneflies, and waxworms for trout. Um, as far as bugs, you know, the buggy baits. Um, uh, most of them come in these little plastic containers. These are semi-waterproof. They're smooth edges. They fit in your pocket. They're designed that you can go into the creeks and go and, you know, fish and would not have to. That's you can smart. put them anywhere. We saw a lot of those. It's, it's just such a simple, like, I like that. It's, it's high. Cool. These are really nice cases. Um, was that you your know. idea? That was their idea. Um, well, they had a case per, before and I told them to improve it. But, you know, other customers had the same idea. They knew they had to improve it. Mm. And um, we all talked about it. So I, this is not my idea, but I was just. I was just around and part of the process. So here's our little uh, stone flies. Stone flies were the very first baits that Nico released. Hmm. You know, model number one was a clear stone fly. Um, so we have the stone flies. Um, my favorites are these caddis flies. These are like little Helger mites. These are survival baits. If the fish don't hit these, they're not biting. <laughs> really put these on um these uh, are a good steady sellers people love these people buy come back for these um they come in two sizes here's a smaller one when i fish uh I'm, I'm not a stock trout guy um but i will hike up in the blue ridge for natives and right there the little tiny caddis flies it's always the most reliable they'll the, the trout are small, tiny little guys, mm. so a tiny little bait. No, they'll they'll attack the bigger ones. They'll attack the uh, stone flies, the large caddis flies. I just don't get can't get a hook in them. But the seem, smaller it ones. seems like bluegill will also smoke that stuff too. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, oh absolutely. Um, the wax worms are. I sell a ton of these. Not so much in Virginia, um, but up north in Pennsylvania, all across the ice belt. People fish these for trout. These are super soft. When I talked about earlier in the show, they were designed, engineered to be the same softness as a real worm. These really feel like a real worm. They are super soft. Um, very unique. Nico's the only company in the world that does that. Hmm. And we have, um, I won't open this one, but we have these little tiny mayflies. Um, these are really cool. Um, you actually take a magnifying glass to these. <laughs> they, uh, they, they look like... They look like uh, stealth fighters. Oh, my gosh. Um, and it's and really cool because if you get angles just right. So, guys, just above my head is going to be a zoomed-in picture of this thing <laughs> so you can look at it because uh, I think that is absolutely fascinating. Here, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, now, for stock trout, we have these what we call scent balls and, of course, the waxworms. And um, the I think here in the Virginia area, maybe Maryland, Virginia, I think smaller the smaller versions would probably be mm -hmm. more popular. Um, most of the... Uh, like say, if you draw a line east and west from the bottom of Pennsylvania, across the U.S., everybody goes for this size here. Mm -hmm. um, these are again, Nico's the only company that makes these. They have a super scented core. You know, all of Nico's products are scented. Um, the the scent the core in here is scented at 150 times what we can normally do. What kind of scent? It depends. Um, uh, for the scent balls, they're either sh uh, squid or shrimp. Mm -hmm. And the concept behind these, so these are very, these are very interesting. So um, these actually apply to smallmouth fishing as well. Um, but uh, you can use these. The concept behind these is that they're number one, they're very soft. So again, remember we talked about a fish can put a bait in its mouth and spit it out before you can even react. This slows that process down to mm -hmm. human time um, because it's so soft. While it's in their mouth, they're getting a burst of flavor. You remember those candies like gum? You could chew and you had a little bit of liquid in them. We're using that concept for mm. fish. Mm. So when this gets into the fish's mouth, um, typically scented baits uh, emit scent at a uniform, you know, level. This provides another dimension to scent dispersion. So when the fish bites onto it, um, he gets a burst of scent or flavor. I I'm not sure what it is for a fish, um, but scent or flavor could be either one. But um, that's slowing the process down. So you, the fish is analyzing this. While he's doing that, you can get a hook set. It's kind of like when I eat my Uncrustable, my peanut butter and jelly. You know, <clears throat> they get that grape <clears throat> you know, going down. I just, you know, I get excited. I, I don't so, let it down. I just keep eating it. I'm, I'm going to just tell you a little bit more about these scent balls. Go for it. Um, they're the Japanese for years 
I've been fishing these scent balls in a manner which, for some reason, people in the U.S. just have not adopted. And that's used as an attractant. So what you would do is you would just add a scent ball to your baits. That's all. For it, You get increased production. So hmm. let's just say, um, I'll give you a concrete example. Uh, I was catfishing on Santee Cooper in South Carolina. Went with a guide. We had eight rods out. Fishing with a pro. Um, we decided to add scent balls to half four rods, or you, most of the time it was four rods. And the other four rods were, um, both rods had bait. It was cut herring. Cut herring alone, cut herring plus, plus one scent ball. We caught three times more fish no on the herring plus the scent ball. Could you show those back up to the camera then again too? Just yeah. So <clears throat> we um, went fishing in Alaska for halibut. Now, the scent balls are too big because they're, they're using like eight, I don't know, six, I don't know what they use, 16 odd or eight odd, it's just massive hooks. Can't get these on. So, what we did, we, we used other Nico baits. Um, and up there, we're using cut bait. Um, and at the end of the day, we came up with a very similar number three times more halibut on fish or on uh, rigs that had a Nico plastic plus bait combination. Hmm. And so, I've used this for really, really tough days. When I'm thinking there, I really should catch a fish. It's really tough. Um, if I have a scent ball in my bag, I'll pull out a scent ball, re-rig, and I'll usually pull out a fish. I think you just sold me, Scott. I think I um, might be. Uh, it's a very difficult. <laughs> well, it, it's it's something it's that people grind. really don't. It, it's a it's a way of fishing that people are not accustomed to. It's a new. Well, it's new for most people. It's been around. So a lot of people don't know this, but Nico, <clears throat> it's it's really the most advanced plastic in the world, most for for fishing, for soft baits. Um, Nico manufactures soft plastics for four of the most famous brands in fishing in the world. Do they have a patent on it, or is how does that? It, it no, there's no patents. We talk about patent in various things. Um, we still could. Um, it's not in the U.S. Is a different world. So it's like um, the KFC recipe thing, then, sort of. Yeah, speak? kind of. Okay. Um, but yeah, these um, we make we make these for four other companies mm. that sell them throughout the world. Um, and they're, you know, they're great for if you're gonna go salmon fishing. I mean, we got guys pulling in salmon left and right out on the west coast um, with them, and um, it's a, just a very versatile bait. Um, is there, there, I think for a lot of stores, it's probably pretty tough because people don't know about it and you have to educate them. Mm -hmm. Oh, they're going to know no, about it No, that's important. Yeah, they're definitely going to know about it now. I didn't realize that. So yeah. then you would put then, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, you would put scent above color, of course, clearly. And then w would that be that one of your, your higher, if you had to pick from No, one? well, scent and color, it would depend. Um, for, I think for the Shenandoah, I mean, if I if I haven't really ranked them before, but since you asked me, um, I think I I'd probably rank color above scent really? on the Shenandoah, okay, because it's a it's a flowing body of water. Fish have to make a quick decision. The scent dispersed. The scent might not probably will has not reached the fish by the time the fish has made a decision. Um. I think for largemouth and crappie and other fish, certainly for trout. Trout, trout. I don't know if this is scientific or not. I haven't researched it, but the scent balls just really seem to work well with stock trout. Mm -hmm. And so I'm at this point, I'm assuming that the scent is the major factor for that. Um, I, would, so, I would definitely think scent would be very, like, I would put that above color possibly, at least anecdotally for me. Yeah, I, I, mean, I think on the Shenandoah, the water, so when I fish it, mm -hmm. the water is usually really, really clear. And they're they're accustomed to prey swimming, you know, swimming or drifting by pretty quick. And they really only have a split section, second. And I don't think, you know, scent's not something that I, you can easily see in the water. You, you don't know how far it's being dispersed. Um, my gut feeling is it's not as far as, you know, it's not that far. I, mm. think, I think the fish see the bait and are taking action probably before they smell it. Now, I have in the early days, um, now I'll tell you, you know, a couple stories. When I was learning, because I had never fished with scented baits before until I fished with Nico, um, 
you know, the one good thing about the baits of the scent is they're built in. So you just stretch them out and you help recharge the scent. Hmm. It's built in. You don't have to apply it. Um, every now and then when fishing slows down, you're, you're always losing the scent. If you can smell it, it's being, there's less scent left. It's always being dispersed. Um, so uh, the, the bait gets weaker and weaker scent-wise, naturally. And uh, again, if you stretch it, you'll get more. Well, it, it recharges it. But I've, I've recharged, you know, stretch the bait, go back. And I've caught, I, I tend to catch a, a fish afterwards. So a scent does matter. I mean, they will see it. They will, maybe they'll probably approach it. Um, they may be indecisive. And you go back, you stretch the bait, you go back. You know, they haven't had that hook set experience. They said so they haven't had a negative experience yet. You present it to them again and they check it out again. And now there's some scent there. And that, that I, I think that's a little more effective. Mm. You know, I, I don't know for sure. It's fishing. Mm. It's hard to tell. You, know. you sold us on it. That's for yeah. sure. <laughs> so if, uh, obviously we carry a lot of your stuff here at Jake's, but if <clears throat> customers online that are watching this from who knows where, where else can they purchase your Nico baits? Um, well, obviously here in the DMV, Jake's is the place to go. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you're going to purchase online, go to nico-fishing.com and look for the button that says shop now or online store. And that'll take you right to our online shop. And if I also, cause Jenny will kill us, you can also buy online, uh, at Jake's yes. with, with some Nico products. Yeah. We, I, I think we put oh, that's right. Yep. Yes. I already hear her yelling at me in my and, ear. Um, <laughs> and, uh, Jake's will be carrying our brand new pink helgramites too. Yeah. Pepper gum. Yeah. Pepper gum. Is it pepper gum? Pepper gum. Pepper gum. Okay. I want to make, make, make sure just, just for uh, editing purposes. That is. And Scott's local too. I know people like local yeah. and you know, you're just right down the road in Manassas, I believe. And yeah, I'm, area, I'm, so. I'm here in uh, Virginia, Northern Virginia, Manassas. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, if anybody wants to take me fishing one day, hit me up. You can hit me up through the site. Um, it's what I do. That's what I'm here for. I'm here to learn, and uh, we're all here to make people happy and enjoy the outdoors and fishing. So and that's cool too. And I did think about that. If you know customers want to reach out to you with any any type of feedback, I'm sure you're right. willing to receive that. And yeah, I, I'm. I'm. Believe me, I've got more work than I can possibly do. Um, mm -hmm. But if somebody reaches out to me and say, "Hey, I've got a trip plan, and just 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 show up and bring some baits," mm -hmm. um, then I'm I'm certainly willing to to go anywhere and um, you know I'll share what I know and share some baits and. You know, hopefully get a learn some learn about how other people do it. I don't have a lot of experience now with fishing with customers anymore because I've been so busy and I'd mm -hmm. like to do that more. Sir, thank you so much. Uh, you're you're a guest. Welcomed anytime on the show if you'd want to come back on. Uh, guys, again, please go. His All of his socials will be down below in the episode description. Please like and follow him everywhere. Also, please check out his website for all the different bases. So stay tuned for anything else new that drops. And again, please give us a like and subscribe. That really helps us out with the algorithm. We're the fastest growing fishing podcast in Virginia, Maryland, and D.C. We are Fishing the DMV. See ya. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV. With your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.